Hey everybody, this is Black Diamond from the Crew Network, and you're listening to Basic Black After Dark Podcast, the show that meets you where you are and gives you what you ask for. This has been a special month coming in for me. We are celebrating National Adoption Month. It's such a meaningful time to highlight the importance of building families through adoption. Adoption is a legal process that allows someone to become the parent of a child, even though the parent and child may not be related by blood. But in every other way, adopted parents are the child's parents. I am pleased that we are celebrating National Adoption Month and connecting with advocates from India. Yet we are live with India with unique challenges and perspectives on adoption. Please welcome my guests, Lashmi Menon and Ruby Naka. Thank you, Black. Hello. Thank you. Hi, how are you doing? Doing good, doing yeah. good. Thank you for having me. No, thank you, thank you for, for joining Thank you for the wonderful us. opportunity. Thank you so much, Black. Oh man, we've been working on trying to get this together for the longest. Um, we've been talking for years. And as advocates in India, can you share some of the unique challenges and cultural perspectives surrounding adoption that you encounter in your work? Yeah, uh, I can start uh, by answering that uh, question. Uh, you know, the biggest challenge that we face is adoption itself, like in the sense that, like, you know, uh, 15, 20 years ago, um, adoption was not as popular as it is now. Uh, so, a lot of children were available, but not many families were available to be taken into. But you know, fast forward to 2024, now the situation is a bit different. There are children available and there are families available, but the families are particular about what kind of a child they want to adopt. Like, you know, they want a very young child, a healthy child, and things of that nature. But those things have changed also over a period of time. The economics of the families have changed. So not many people are giving away their children uh, that are healthy. So they are giving up children uh, that are with special needs, which not many Indians are open to. So these are uh, some of the cultural context that I can present to you that, you know, 20 years ago, there were not many families that were coming forward to, but forward to 2024, there are families available, but they are very particular about what kind of child that they want to adopt. So it impacts the families a great deal for those who um, are involved and the children that's involved. So people who want to adopt as well as those who are unable to care for their children at this time. So it's like a great impact. The process typically involves navigating the central adoption resource authority, which is CARA there. Is it the central yes. regulatory body that manages adoptions? Correct. It is the, the federal government at, at the federal government level. This is this is a statutory body created by the power of the parliament. Uh, so it is called the Central Adoption Resource Authority. Uh, this was always there, uh, but this has been given more power, more teeth. Uh, by the par parliament. So it has become much more stronger and powerful now. And there were some international instruments that India as a country had signed 
uh, one is called UNCRC, United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. Other one is called as Hague Convention on Intercountry Adoption. So because we have signed these two international instruments, which is binding on our country because we ratified, we had to make certain uh, changes on our end which make the system much more stronger and transparent. So in this entire process of transforming ourselves, CARA also became much more stronger. So does CARA set guidelines to streamline domestic and international adoptions that prioritize the preparation of adoption parents in the best interest Absolutely. of the child? Absolutely, but it is only under the Juvenile and Justice Act. There is an act called the Juvenile and Justice Act. Uh, CARA only can um, do adoptions or set regulations that are under the purview of Juvenile and Justice Act. We do have another act called the Hindu Adoption and Maintenance Act. So CARA is also trying to work slowly in that uh, sphere also, but not as widely, as strongly as it is able to work under the Juvenile and Justice Act, or in short, it is called as JJ Act. Wow. You, you guys have come a long way. Prior to us coming on air, uh, I, I've been talking about um, how far you have come since we initially started um, when I had been speaking to the, my other guest, Laxmi, about a program that they were getting started called Adoption A. And um, just to come back, after COVID and to see how far you have come, what has your experience been while interacting with prospective adoptive parents? Okay. You know, I do, um, uh, go ahead, let me go ahead. Yeah, Ruby, thanks. Uh, actually, uh, Black, uh, that was a very good question because, you know, uh, if I can take you a couple of decades back, uh, Ruby and I both, adopted around the same time ruby did so much earlier actually a few years earlier but i got into the adoption process uh, in 2008 when things were really not regulated at all there was cara was there but uh, this kind of uh, regulation was not there it was not a statutory body and especially international adoption was very very difficult and awareness also was very, very limited at that time. So uh, I was fortunate that I uh, met Ruby online. He had already trodden that path. He was an adoptive parent at that time, and he was already mentoring prospective adoptive parents. So that is how I met him. Yeah. And uh, otherwise, I do not know what would have happened because, you know, I was not in India at that time. I was in another country and I was, yeah, I was actually in um, a Southeast Asian country. I was uh, based there and I was trying to adopt from India and nobody knew anything. Even the embassies there, there was no one who could support because of the lack of awareness, you know. So even after a few years, when I first started Option A in 2020, I felt that people were still stumbling in the dark because there was, by then, of course, Juvenile Justice Act and CARA had come in, but people were still, uh, to the common man, all these were still very dark areas. But like you rightly said, in the last few years, I think a lot of awareness has come in. And uh, like you said, yes, post-COVID, everything has gone online. There is a lot of information. And now we see almost anyone who is contemplating adoption at least is aware of CARA. So I feel at the regulatory level, it is a baby step. But we have taken that step. Yeah. In terms of regulation, it's a big step. Now comes the part about attitudes and acceptance all these things. I guess that will be the next big battle. But yes, the first step is taken. So families yeah, if I may add to yeah, yeah, what, yeah, what yes, Lakshmi had yeah. said is absolutely correct. And uh, the, about the attitudes, um, what I see is, you know, I do a lot of uh, pre-adoption counseling to prospective adoptive parents. 
Uh, there are few areas that, you know, we still have a long way to go, but it's changing though. Uh, for example, you know, if I tell them uh, how many years it takes uh, to wait to adopt a young child, rather they could opt for a child little older, or they could opt for a child with special needs. The willingness uh, to open, to adopt a child of that nature is very low. Uh, so, but it's changing, you know, because as uh, Lakshmi was saying, that the awareness is increasing. Uh, so there are more and more number of people are coming forward uh, to adopt children that are older and that are with special needs because we do not have very many children in our system under the Juvenile and Justice Act that are very young. So if somebody is opting to uh, take a child who is very young, they will have to wait literally for years. So we kind of encourage them in a very gentle way to consider these options, but uh, it takes, um, uh, it's a challenging uh, situation for the families to navigate through. That's one area that I have noticed so parents struggle with. So families who are adopting, they go through several steps, including registration, background checks, home studies, and matching the children based on specific criteria. What are some of the criteria that they need to have in order to be able to adopt? Because I know we were talking at one time, and um, and this wasn't uh, through a podcast, it was just a regular conversation that we was having. Um, and I've asked several, several questions about the criteria as far as being in a specific area in India and being able to adopt opposed to me being in the U.S. saying that I wanted to adopt. What is the criteria and how hard would it be for me in the United States to want to adopt? Because you're saying that there is uh, children that's there that um, have special needs or of a certain age that need to be adopted, but it's hard to find adopted parents. So if I came forward and said that I wanted to adopt a couple of special needs children and bring them here, what would the criteria be and how hard would it be for me to be able to adopt one of the children? Yeah, um, I will just uh, start with the uh, Indian side for the adoptive parents that are living here, call them as the resident Indians. So the, the, the criteria is very simple. Uh, one is you can adopt under the JJ Act, you can adopt either a single person or as a married couple. And then if you are adopting the age has to be about 20, the you have to be about 25 years and above if you're married 25? you have to have two years of age. yes and if you are married uh, you should have had two years of stable marriage and then you know it doesn't specify uh, how to say like a health conditions but it just says that you have to be healthy and financially sound to be able to take care of the child. And these are the prospective parents' side. But then how to do adoption is, it is purely online only. That is through the government set oh, portal. Wow. You, cannot, you cannot go to an adoption agency or anyone directly and say, hey, I want this child. No, it can only be done through the government set portal on the government website. So basically, Block, you know, um, several decades ago, uh, abuses surfaced in the field of adoption because of this precise thing that was not there. People would just walk into any place and anyone and say, I want this child and they, they, they take the child. So the government had to put an end to that. Uh, so now, basically, government acts as an intermediary between the child and the adoptive parent. Okay, so now the government recognizes certain private NGOs as adoption agencies and sends these available children to these agencies to look after. So now our organization is recognized as one of those adoption agencies and we receive children from the government. So our role is to Two front. One is to upload all the information of the child to the government portal that I just mentioned about. And the second is to look after the child in the specification that the government mentions about. From the parent side, 
they they apply to the same portal that i just said about so basically as i said the government acts as an intermediary running this portal receiving information from us as an ngo from the child's end and looked up looking after the child and the parent side they have applied to the same portal and the intermediary who matches the parents with the child of their choice i'll give you one example let's say i am a parent applying to cara portal opting to adopt a child i have to state during my registration what kind of a child do i want to adopt primarily there are only three choices one is the gender whether i want a boy or a girl and what is the age group that i want you know there are different uh, slabs of age that you can choose or the system itself automatically chooses based on your age and the third one is if i want a child who is healthy or a special needs child and fourth option is the geographical area you know we speak so many languages we have so many different cultures and tradition so the government want to be sure that the children are placed in their own socio cultural milieu so they have to state the region like you know for example i am from the southern india as lakshmi is so we have to choose southern india so that children from southern india with the prospective parents from southern india are matched so once the government identifies or matches the child with the parent the parent receives a notification and the ngo receives the notification saying hey these two are being matched and those two will start communicating stating hey please come on this particular day to receive the child and you know when they come to receive the child is the first time they will be meeting people physically called adoption committee there are few government officials ngo officials a pediatrician all these people are there to meet the parents to understand you know where they are coming from and what the child is able to offer and then they present the child to the parent so this is the so you, indian you, side i'm talking you, about i i just want to back up for a minute you said uh, maybe i didn't hear this correctly i'm hoping i didn't you said well, what the child has to offer yeah i mean like you know when the when i say child has to offer what i mean is what is child able to do you know the parents are of course they're already matched it's not like uh, uh with the parents are going to say yes or no you know parents are basically come to take the child they are presenting the child to the parent to take the child because the parents have the option to look at the child even beforehand before they come because once the matching is taken place and the notification is received the parents have certain amount of time to say yes or no so only once the parents say yes they confirm that they can come to this particular place so if their parents are coming to this place they have almost made a decision for certainty to take the child but the government still want to be sure that there are people checking you know the adoptive parents their documents their validity of the documents everything so that is why this adoption committee is sitting there to look at these documents and then the uh, child is presented to them it, uh, to me and I, and i i guess it's my ignorance or maybe i'm not too culturally aware but it's almost pick and chattel when they come to look at the child to see if that's the child that they want if for me no. I and mean, this is just my perspective of it if you're going to say that you want to be an adopted parent of a little girl and you have the history of yeah. the little girl um of what you know she and maybe a picture is there um she's healthy whatever 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 and then they go to see the child if she doesn't look like what they expect they can deny the child and the child is standing right there to hear the denial do they if they say they're going to accept the child and they want the child do they give them a bonding period or whether it's or do they just take the child that, that at that moment right there and if that happens no, where uh, are the parents 
our adoption regulations do provide for the bonding period opportunity if uh, the <clears throat> adoptive agencies that the NGOs looking at looking after the children have the responsibility to enable the parents to develop the bonding before they take the child and uh, you know we in our NGO we try to do that you know we always encourage the parents to come and spend some time uh, it's not like you know just uh, taking uh, a product from a shop you know this is the life that we are trying to match to grow up in your home and and this child has grown up in this environment where she has friends where she has caretakers where she has certain favorite things that she likes so if you could spend some time probably two days three days four days a week you know longer it is better so that you understand exactly what this child likes what she doesn't like who her friends are who her favorite caretaker is so that the transition is smooth but you know there are some parents who don't have that much of time but we insist that you know that you should do that in the best interest of the child it's unlike you know buying a product you know uh, this is not like that you have to spend some time so most of the time i would say 99% of the time parents uh, i'm assuming it's the same thing with the many of the adoption agencies also that they do comply so it's interesting that the biological parent is there as well because in, in this country they don't normally allow that to happen when that's um the adoption they have closed and open adoptions so i'll say it that way but from what you're saying they want to place the children with their likeness as far as where they're from so there's almost no chance of me adopting a child that's from india unless it am i correct if i say unless it's a hard to place child and what do you consider a hard to place child yeah uh, the thing is go ahead lakshmi go ahead lakshmi uh, no no it's okay ruby i was just saying black um, in india right now uh, it is mostly only closed adoptions and not open adoption so the biological okay. parent is not in the picture at all here okay so yeah when ruby was referring to they that is you know they present the child to us it is only the adoption agency and not the biological okay. Okay. yeah i think ruby can uh, elucidate more on that so <laughs> please go ahead ruby yeah. Yeah. it was kind of confusing yeah. i was saying that it would be hard for the parents yeah. to watch their child go away yeah. from no, them no, it's no. already hard enough for I them so i was just kind of you know wondering how how would that play out so i understand the process can be thorough to ensure child safety and family readiness but it could also be lengthy complex due to the demand for careful compliance with the legal regulations generally how long is the process yeah but uh, before that i think uh, i will go back to the earlier question that you asked about you being able to adopt you know how difficult it is uh and lakshmi is correct when i said they i was referring to adoption agency and the adoption committee okay. which has a group of people making the decisions in our culture uh, and also the regulations define adoption as a process where the child is permanently separated from the biological parents and become the legal ch child of the adoptive parents with the rights responsibility and privileges attached to a, a biological child that's a definition so adoptive families sorry biological family is permanently separated from the child okay so now so coming to the question of, of uh, yeah and in our now we're saying this determination uh, of parental rights and how how fast does that happen the termination of parental rights and there is a do process they, do they, you know different right you know for example there are different ways the child comes into the adoption screen one is called the surrendering that is biological parent bringing the child before the government and say i can't look after this child i would like to give this child up for adoption and the second way is, is called abandonment that? no right. there are That's no penalties but but, but, but the so state is, yeah but the state when they come for surrendering state is duty bound to see if there are any if there are any needs that the state can meet to help the family to keep the child so they can extend if they have something that they can offer to the family 
to ensure that the child stays with them rather than with adoptive parents. So they have to give counseling. They have to understand their needs and why they want to uh, give them up for adoption. And if at the end of the day, if the parents are very sure that they want to give this child for adoption, there is a certain amount of paperwork that the parents have to complete to give the child for for surrender. And uh, the second okay. aspect of the second aspect of bringing the child into the adoption stream is called as abandonment. So there are parents who leave the children here and there, and uh, in that case, there are no papers to be signed or anything because they left the child and went. So in both of these. Uh, routes the government regulation states that we have to give grace period for example in surrendering there is a grace period of 60 days from the day they surrender to change their mind to come back to claim the child if they want to and in abandonment government assumes that the child is found who for whom the ch parents are looking for so we have to put an advertisement in the newspaper and the television to see if there are anybody, if there is anyone looking for this child, and they also have to wait for 60 days. So basically, there is grace period in both the routes of 60 days to be sure that we are not taking away any child from the biological parents by force or by collusion of any kind or anything of that nature. So there is ample amount of, uh, what should I say, time for the parents to come and claim. But after the 60 days, the system kicks in where they declare the child legally free for adoption. So only in such a question. Yeah. Uh, being that I... I kind of felt that this was going to happen to me when I asked questions and I had you guys on as a guest um, because my emotions get involved because I've adopted several children. And um, I understand um, that we're in different places and whatnot. So I'm, I'm becoming a culturally aware. You know, you're mentioning that abandonment, a, a person can either they don't know where their child is or either they're leaving their child and you say they have 60 days. But if you leave a child that say eight, nine or 10, that eight, nine, or ten year old know who their parents are. Do they ever come forward and say, "Who my mom or my dad or my parents or these people?" And your government have went to them and said something to a, a family that you abandoned your child because your child has been identified, or this little girl or boy has been identified as saying that you are their parents. Is there a penalty in that way when they find out who the parent is, even though the parent didn't come forward and the parent? purposely did could not take care of the child but abandoned them so they wouldn't have ties to them that was one question and the uh, other question is has there ever been a, a a time where a family had more than one child say i say i was in india and i had two children and i couldn't take care of two children so i gave one away and i kept the other or with the agency or the government say if i can't take care of one they have to take the other one as well yeah, the first question, you know, if the child is old enough to uh, state who her parents are and things like that, you know, unlike United States where there's only one language in our country, we have multiple languages. So what parents sometimes tend to do is to take and leave the child in a state where they don't speak that particular language. This is I'm talking about out of my experience that I have seen. Um, you know, we have rescued one individual who is appeared to be about 14 years of age. Somehow, I think the parents may have put him in a train and they may have gotten into the train, all of them together. And after the child fell asleep, they just got off the train and the train went on. And uh, it so happened that we rescued the child at our railway station and child was not able to speak our language. Uh, so it is so difficult for us to be able to uh, locate the parents, what we try to do. And also, when we found out what language this child speaks, this language is spoken in multiple states in India. So we sent to which state we did not know. So it is a challenge to find uh, where the parents are because our systems are 
still what should i say evolving and not there yet to identify the parents and even if they do uh, the penalties uh, would be much minimal because they may have you know given up this child for the reasons of poverty for not being able to take care of the health care needs and things of that nature so the system is much more compassionate um than uh, retributive and the second question what was your second question lot if you could just refresh my memory if if they had um more than one, ah, child, one child and, and they yeah yeah and they decided to give yeah. one away from what i understand say i was a parent that had a boy and a girl and i couldn't take right, care right. of both most likely yeah. the girl would be the one that would be given away and the boy would be the one that would stay am i correct yeah right um again um unlike in the united states where the child protection system is so strong and in our country it is just evolving uh, our child protection systems are just coming to the picture and we don't have a very strong foster care system and again foster care also is just opening up so if somebody comes forward and says that hey i want to give up one child and i want to keep one child the, the child protection system offers this family you know several options instead of giving up this child up for adoption where the siblings have to be separated and the parents has to be parents have to be separated so they would offer them uh, foster care or uh, they would offer them an institutional care where the parents could come and visit and they can still be parents so despite offering all these options and if the family still says that they do not want to uh, keep the child they will not force that second child also to be given away because again the system is much more compassionate uh, than retributive and they understand you know again if you want to keep this child and if you want to give away one child where do your resources come from to take care of the child that you want to keep so only and if and the system becomes convinced that they do have sufficient resources to care for that one child or if the system can extend additional resources to keep the second child they do that but if the family is very insistent that they want to part ways with this one child government takes the child and place the child for adoption wow i am I'm, i'm listening to how how things are, are done there in in india and how things are done here in the us and i can't speak for every state i can i and what i won't i won't speak for any state i'll speak for myself because i've been through um that process and i'll speak for my experience but i'm 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 hearing that you guys are so close to what is done in the us and i'm just so happy and pleased to hear that you've come this far and i can just taste it that you are picking up on so much with with your advocacy you know um, um my question also is going to be do advocates work to address societal biases and provide the resources and networks for adoptive families and i see that you do we have something here called family preservation where we try to preserve the family and what you had just said sounds very close to what you're offering when you say you offer them other options and and that's that's wonderful and it just makes me feel it makes me feel so much better i guess i take so take on the world's children when i hear anything about children being separated from their their families whether it's because the family needs to be separated because of whatever the situation may be or if the government do uh the separation but i haven't heard you mention anything about abuse because sometimes that's a reason of why a child will come into care because the child may have been abused how do your country work with abuse um with the families yeah. and the children yeah a good question you know as i told you in our adoption there are two streams that i mentioned abandonment and surrender there is also another one called orphan let's say for example during covid a child lost her parent and none of the extended family members want to take care of this child and the government is absolutely certain that there is no one out there looking up to look after this child they will also declare the child legally free for adoption so now i have stated 
three routes. One is abandonment, other one is surrendering, other one is orphanhood. Now, lately, this year, the Supreme Court has added two more elements to it. One is called as unfit parents. The second one is called non-visitational parents. So I'll just explain this too to you to help you understand. So unfit parents yeah, is where that. the question, yeah, the question that you just explain asked it to about, the listeners because I understand it. Yeah, under, the listeners right. won't get it. Right. When you say when you say unfit parents, that abuse comes in that category. Any kind of neglect or abuse where the government feels that parents cannot or will not be able to take care of this child, they have a system in place to declare the parents as unfit parents. And if they declare the parents as unfit parents, then they will be eligible for adoption. But the system of declaring the parents as unfit, you know, has to be very, very strong and strict because there cannot be any room for abuse by the system itself. You get my point, Vlad, what I'm saying? Yeah. So yeah, they, they want to be certain. They want to be certain that the system is proving the parents to be unfit in very strong way without abusing the parents to separate the child from the parents. So they take the uh, system very seriously. For example, if the parent is, both the parents are so badly addiction, addicted to drugs or alcohol, um, you know, they've been through various measures of uh, getting rid of this addiction, but they're unable to, and the children are being addicted, uh, affected. Children are malnourished, children are not being able to go to school, you know, all these things are being identified and said uh, to themselves, no, this child is not going to be growing up in this home in the best interest of her interest. So the only way that the child interest can be served is to have this child in another place. So the first option would be declare the parents as unfit to see if the parent, if the child can be placed in foster care to give them some time to you know, clean up themselves. But if that is also not working, then they would consider taking the child to adoption. And the last one is unfit parents. As I said, if the child can be placed in an institution uh, so the parents can come and visit, and for example, after we place the child in an institution, and if the parents don't choose to come back at all for 12 months in a row, that would be considered as a red flag under the banner of non sorry non visitation so even if there is no visitation for 12 months in a row also government can declare the child legally free for adoption so basically what i'm trying to say is government has given a lot of leeway for the parents to look at themselves to clean up themselves to have their children with them but system is saying if you don't then we have other ways to help the child to grow in a family because our obligation to UNCRC that is United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child is that the child has a right to grow in a family. So if your family is not the family that the child should grow up in, then we should have an alternative family that the child to grow up in. But irrespective of what, your family has the first right, first priority. But if that is not going to be the family, the government is saying, the system is saying, we have alternatives to look after the child because the family is the primary right of the child. It sounds like India does mirror the United States in a lot of ways. Uh, it's just the terminology may be a little different. Um, we do 15 of 22 months if the child is in care. And you had mentioned if the parent does not um, see the child within 12 months. So it's almost it's similar to what we do here. Um, and, and, and I'm ha very happy to hear that. Um, Lashmi, having a biological and an adoptive daughter, it has to bring a rich blend of experience and perspectives into your family. Celebrating National Adoption Month must be particularly meaningful for you and highlighting the unique journey of adoption while celebrating the bond you share with both of your daughters. And I've seen um, pictures of, of your, your beautiful daughters. I would love to hear more about how adoption has shaped your family life. 
Okay, thank you for that, uh, Black. This is something I could go on and on about <laughs> forever. <laughs> Actually, uh, you know, I had absolutely no concerns. Maybe it was ignorance. Maybe it was idealism. I don't know. But when I, you know, had a biological child, as soon as I had the biological child, I was sure I would adopt two or even before I had her. It's just the gender that became very clear after I had a first child, you know, when I had a biological daughter, then I was sure the second one would be a girl too, so that they could grow up together. That's all. <laughs> but yeah, but it's once I got into the system that I realized People were very apprehensive for me, you know. Everyone else around me was apprehensive except me, probably. Everyone was asking me, did you want, do you really want to do this? How will your, you know, elder one take this? There will be problems within the family. That is when I realized there is actually a distinction between a biological child and an adopted child child, at least in the parents' minds or people's minds rather, not parents, but mm -hmm. in the society. And then I realized, okay, I mean, it's only natural for people to think that way. So I have been fortunate that my elder daughter, she was the biggest champion. And, you know, she was around four years old when I started the uh, process. And for her at that age, it was just a sister coming home and she didn't care how, you know, that's the <laughs> <laughs> that's the advantage with children. She just didn't care how she didn't ask me even once. Why is she not coming from your tummy? So uh, I had told her that oh, there wow. is a special. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's so normal that it makes me think, why is it that we have all these questions in our head? For her, it was just, okay, I told her there's a baby waiting for you in a special place and uh, we have to get her, we have to work hard to get her from there. You know, she's waiting for her home and you're going to be her sister. And she was just so excited about it and it was very natural. So I think a little bit of that rubbed off on me too. Uh, for me too, it was just not once black did I think, I don't know, maybe it was idealism after all. I didn't think of, you know, there going to be any, the possibility of there being any adjustment issue between my kids, the two of them. And probably it just fell in place like a self-fulfilling prophecy. The adjustment was very seamless for the younger one because the elder one was already there waiting with open arms, you know. So it was a very, yeah, yeah, a touch wood. Of course, there were other issues for me in terms of extended family or, you know, even within the family, a little bit of resistance from different quarters. And then I was living abroad. So there was uh, no proper support system in place. All those issues were there. But within the family, I have had absolutely no problem with my two kids blending. And even now, both of them are not with me. They have gone abroad for their education. But both of them went together. <laughs> when the elder one had to go, the younger one just went along. She said, I cannot stay away from my sister. <laughs> so I'm a little jealous of them sometimes, envious of them, because... <laughs> <laughs> the bond between the sisters is much stronger than probably, probably much stronger than the bond either one of them has with me. And I realize that's how it should be because they are the ones who are going to be left, you know, even when I leave them, leave this world, they are going to be together. So, but I must say that when it comes to the larger society, even today, I do get questions. In fact, a black. I hope I'm not taking too much of your time here, uh, because you know, I, no. yeah. <laughs> on this topic, I could just go on and on. Uh, at, at that time, that is in 2008, when I registered for adoption, I had a lot of resistance even from the system. You know, when am I audible? Yes, 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 you are. It's just people are popping in and they're saying hello and good evening and hi everyone. And I'm so glad that you all are able to join us. Um, what one of the questions that I well, you should you, you should be very proud of yourself 
for one, to be able to have them um, bond the way that they have bonded. So you did a, a wonderful job with that. My question is, Thank you. if if your daughter had been older, say she was uh, maybe 12 or 13 years old, would the government have asked her, how does she feel about another child coming into the home? Or uh, would yes. it just been to the adult? Oh, they would have, okay. The, uh, you know, we have this process called the home study. So, yes. um, in, yeah, in fact, in this case too, Black, my daughter was uh, actually when um, things finally worked out for me, it was, uh, she was around five and a half. My elder one was around five and a half. So the social worker did meet her too. The social worker who came to do the home study did meet her and mm -hmm. spend about 10 minutes with her asking her, you know, how you felt about it and everything. So I'm sure if she was an older child, probably it would have been a more in-depth uh, process. That does happen. Mm -hmm. They do meet everybody uh, as far as possible. Mm -hmm. I uh, understand that they also meet the extended family in India. You know, there are still joint families with grandparents. So as far as possible, the home study uh, takes into account the extended family as well to make sure that everyone is on board. Wow. Look, if I may so also, good. if I may also, if I may add one uh, in the situation here, you know, if the child is older to be placed in adoption, the regulations also state that the child has to consent to be placed in adoption. If the child is above six years of age, the child has to state if she wants to be placed in adoption or not. If the child says she is comfortable with where she is, that is the institution or foster care or whatever it is, the child cannot be forced into adoption. Oh, wow. That young, six years of age, making a, a life decision like that. Well, yeah. you know, there's, there's some bright six-year-olds, you know, out there. And Ruby, um, sorry, not Ruby. Last week, you were saying how uh, you got some pushback from adults. Some of those adults should think like some of the children and, and, and be able to accept, embrace, um, because I was hearing that. Some Indian um, public figures have openly adopted children, helping to normalize the adoption in the eyes of the public. Have their openness reduced the stigma that families bond, family bonds uh, can drive outside of biological ties? Um, Absolutely. Yes, you know, <clears throat> there are many celebrities uh, come forward to adopt children. And a uh, lot of adoptive parents you know, ordinary adoptive parents um, became advocates talking about adoption and the social media made things much more easier uh, for people to understand how things uh, go on. Uh, before social media, you know, there was hardly any way for anyone to know how adoption takes place. Even today, as uh, Lakshmi was uh, stating earlier, uh, there are many people who are unaware of the processes of adoption. So definitely the celebrity adoptions and advocacy, social media and awareness by the governments made things much more less uh, stigmatized and it's open. If I may put it into perspective, as I speak to you now, today, that is 1st of November, the available number of children in a country of our size on government portal is about little over 2,000 children. In the entire system I'm talking about. But the number of parents that are waiting to adopt them is above 35,000. Wow. So that's the, that's the uh, mismatch that we have. You know, not many children are coming into the system because the economics of the families have improved over a period of time. At the same time, the awareness has also increased. The awareness has increased. So a lot more people are coming forward to adopt children, but there are not many children in the system. And that's a wonderful thing, you know, that to hear that. Yeah. So the decision to relocate to India was deeply personal and rooted in a profound sense of purpose. Before this shift, you spent years working in the U.S., Ruby, can you tell our listeners why you decided to relocate to India to start this work? Uh, just like Lakshmi said, I can go on talking for hours about this topic. 
you know, um, my wife and I were living in Texas, uh, in a town called Lubbock, Texas, working as physical therapists. And uh, after we got ma- before we even got married, I always told my wife that I have two things to do in my life. One is to be able to adopt children and to be able to relocate to India at some point in time. But, you know, like every one of us, once we settle down in the U.S., you become so comfortable and you tend to forget everything else. Um, And then for eight years, we didn't conceive. So then I started talking to my wife about adoption and she was okay with it because she agreed before our marriage. And then we ended up adopting my first daughter in 2001. And... uh, Second child came in 2004. First child was escorted by the adoption agency to the U.S. because we, they had some uh, issues of leave at the workplace. So the child was escorted. The second child, I had to come to take the child to the U.S. So I came and took the child. I saw the uh, conditions, And I know my country quite well because when I went to the U.S., I was 26 years old. So I lived for 26 years before I left, so I know my country quite well. But that was an eye-opener of the conditions that the children were in an adoption agency. And it, something was telling me that I must go back to India to do this work hands-on. You know, Block, all these years I have been talking to myself and to many people that I'm going back, and including my wife, before marriage, I told her that I need to go back to India. But when that thought came to my mind, someone telling me to go back to India, I began to resist. I said, no, I'm so comfortable here. You know, I have this, I have that, I have bank balances, I have a house, I have cards. I said, no, I don't want to go. But then over a period of time, this voice I was hearing became louder and louder and louder. I just couldn't bear it. I told my wife, you know, if I don't go back to India to do this work, I think I would be one unhappy soul in my grave. So then my wife also uh, said yes. So that's when we relocated back to India in 2006. So primarily, it is our children who inspired us. And also, knowing what I know about my country. And if I may also add one more element, that is my own childhood. I have grown up in a children's home. Uh, for 12 years, from my fifth grade until I finished my graduation, bachelor's degree, I grew up in a children's home. So putting all these two things together uh, made absolute sense. This is something I wanted to do. And, you know, professionally, we were doing quite well in the U.S. And personally, we were doing quite well in the U.S. But this calling that I was hearing, this voice I was hearing in my head, just wouldn't let me stay in peace. And uh, in 2006, as a family, we sold our house, we sold all the electronic gadgets, everything, we put everything, remaining things, we put it on a uh, ship, and then we came in February of 2006, and since then I've been working. And I can't tell you the joy I get uh, doing this work. You know, for me, my work is much more therapeutic than anything else. So I'm so glad that you decided to listen to the voice in your head (laughs) because many people don't. They just think it's just the voice in the head. And I am so happy that you have. uh, Before we wrap up, I just have a a quick question. How do you or how do India protect against human trafficking? You know, we have because that's the number one, the number one. The number one mechanism we have is the government enabling, uh, making enabling legislations and providing systems to implement those legislations. So we do have very strong legislations on the books, but where we seem to fail is the enforcement. You know, enforcement not being strong or weak, you know, whatever. I think uh, we have the systems in place, but we are not able to enforce, you know, but we are still growing. Uh, We are only a country of 70 plus years of independence and we are making our own legislations and amending legislations. 
you know, making the enforcement stronger. So we are getting there, but we are still a step behind, I would say. So answer to your question is through legislations and enforcements. And of course, you know, people like Lakshmi and I, uh, we talk about, you know, the field that we are in uh, with whatever the little that we know to tell people, okay, this is the right way to do, this is the wrong way to do. So there are so many people creating awareness also. And now the social media and all these things are playing a role also. Oh boy, I'm so glad that you guys are. So thank you, thank you, thank you for the work that you're doing there in India because it does affect us all no matter where we're at. I uh, Before we wrap up, I'd love for our listeners to know how they can support you and your work. Can you share any specific ways they can get involved or help, whether it's through donations, volunteering, or spreading the word? What are some options available for those who want to make a difference? Yeah, Black, thank you so much for asking that question. Because see, uh, our adoption agency is a very unique adoption agency because my younger daughter being born as a child with special needs, I have a very uh, soft corner for children that are available for adoption with special needs. So when we requested the government for license, we asked the license to be given only for children with special needs, which means we don't accept children that are healthy. We only take children with special needs. And my alma mater here in town is a hospital, medical hospital, provides medical care to them at no cost. So we try to provide medical care and rehabilitative services as much as we possibly can and make them optimum and uh, present them at an optimum level to the parents to accept them in India. But if they can't, they go abroad. So in this process, the costs to take care of a child with special needs are much more higher than a healthy child. So if so I may put place, it in perspective, ma'am? Is there, is there a place that they could uh, reach out to you or, or uh, a, a link or a number or something yeah, that yeah. you can that's, give us? That's, that's what I'm coming to. You know, our website is www.indiahopehouse.org. I-N-D-I-A-H-O-P-E-H-O-U-S-E, indiahopehouse.org. And there are links on the website that they can go and make a donation. So that's India Hope House. And if you didn't get that, you can definitely reach out to me because I have a lot of that information as well because I've been doing a little research on it as well. And I want to, I, before we go off the air, I want to thank you know, our listeners for chiming in and for viewing us. Uh, Shanette, thank you. Patrice, Trevita, Young at Heart Media Group, thank you, thank you, thank you. And Diana Jones, thank you. But most importantly, I also want to thank you, Lashmi and Ruby, for being such wonderful guests on the podcast. Your insights, passion, and advocacy for adoption, my gosh, was truly inspiring. It was a privilege to hear your stories and to share in meaningful conversations that can make a difference in so many lives. I am grateful for your time, openness, and for bringing such valuable perspectives to our listeners. I definitely am looking forward to more conversations like this in the future because we do talk to each other. I appreciate it. We are here in in the U.S. celebrating National Adoption Month. And um, this is one of my favorite months along with May, which is National uh, Foster Care Month. So um, I want to know just quickly, do you celebrate National Adoption Month in um, India? Yes, we do. And this, what month is that? Month. Is that November. also November? Wow, so November, it's a worldwide yes. thing. Thank you. <laughs> it's a worldwide thing. So that makes me it makes me yeah. more than happy. So if anybody can't tell, I, I'm I'm just in love with the fact that people are opening their hearts and their loving homes to take in these children. Um, it, it doesn't matter where you're at in what country you're in, people are still doing it. And and I, I just want to thank everybody for um, joining in and um, being responsible citizens and taking in these children who didn't ask to be born, didn't ask to be in the situations that they're in. Uh, I, I'm not going to fault any families. Um, for those who know that they can't take care of their children and they're bringing them to an organization or agency, to let them know that they 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 tried or or they cannot do it any longer. Thank you for those um, that choices or other things. I, I ask you, 
to just locate an agency and just try to talk to them, see if they can give you the support that, that you can possibly get. Thank you again, everybody, for tuning in tonight to Basic Black After Dark. Please join us on Sunday, which is my bonus day, November 3rd. We will be chopping it up with Dr. Carolyn Stevens after eight, after dark. Thanks everybody and have a wonderful night and be safe.